Hey, what's going on? Mr. Davis, hope you guys are well. Uh, before I get into my second part, I want to talk about this real quick. This is a big uh, lawn right here. It's called Bowling Green. You know, they didn't bowl there. More of just architectural uh, dimension to show the depth of the uh, Mount Vernon home. And uh, they used to come out here and cut it uh, with scythes. And they had no lawn mowers. And then they had uh, rolling. Today, obviously, they use lawn mowers. But uh, it was just architecture. Um, it was architectural design to bring attention to the mansion. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of things today that are a little off about the mansion, but um, that, that, that just amazed me. People go out and cut this by hand all the time. So next time you mow the lawn, be thankful you have a lawn mower. Secondly, uh, I hope you guys are all doing well out there in the Bay Area. I know the A's lost last night. Uh, tragic loss. I was rooting for you. Game didn't start till nine something here, uh, so I was kind of tired. Didn't watch any of it. Saw in Sports Center this morning. Uh, and then the Giants won, so hey, that's good. And then the Niners just destroyed the Bills. So hopefully those other two make up for the A's loss. Um, one thing I do want to talk about, and hopefully you're paying attention to this, is the presidential race. You cannot but help uh, think politics. You're out here, and I'm staring at the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Capitol Building. It was at the Capitol Building yesterday, the Supreme Court. And uh, I've been following this race very closely. A few things I want you to notice. Um, it is extremely close. But this whole polling with the national poll, you know, Romney's up 49 to 48, or President Obama's up 49 to 48, or Governor Romney versus, Ob this doesn't really matter. It comes down to electoral college. And uh, you should all be studying that. If you haven't studied that yet, uh, you will soon, next few weeks. And basically, each state is allotted a vote on the presidency. And each state votes for the president. So when they take a national poll, I, I, I think you should really just discount that. And what you need to start looking at is how each state is going to vote. For instance, California right now, uh, President Obama is up 13% in most polls. And so that means all 55 electoral college votes will pro probably go for President Obama. Governor Romney did make eight percentage points uh, swing up in California after the last debate. So we'll see if that continues or that just stays. But right now, as we speak, uh, it looks like it's going to go for President uh, Obama. The states that you should really start looking at are Ohio, Virginia, where I'm living. Uh, you have North Carolina, Florida, Arizona, Nevada, Colorado, maybe even Iowa. These are the states that are most likely going to decide the election. So if you really want to know who's going to win the election, if you really want to know what president, who's going to be our next president, you start watching the states individually. Um, great polls are Gallup.com, G-A-L-L-U-P.com, Rasmussen.com, Real, Real Clear Politics, RCP. These are pretty good. There's other ones that are out there. The Pew, they're all pretty good. If you, if you read them all, you kind of get a big spectrum of it. But that's what I really want to encourage you to do. Start watching this race closely. Uh, when I get back on the 3rd, um, I'll actually be in class on the 5th. We'll talk about this in the morning on the 6th. So that's a little little side note for you, politics. Uh, that's where I see it right now. Right now, it really is a toss-up. President Obama has 201 electoral college votes pretty much locked up if they continue the way they're going. And Governor Romney has 181, and they need 270. So there's this big chunk of states that wherever they go, you're going to see the next president. President Washington, when he was elected president, it was unanimous. Every single state in the colony at that point went for President Washington. I mean, it's the only time in our history that's happened. There are a few presidents that gotten close, but it's the only time a unanimous vote has gone for the presidency. So keep an eye on that, and uh, I'm going to give you finish up some tour around here. Not gone for the presidency. A few interesting things here. When you, when you walk around, you can't help but notice the uh, great um, diversity of uh, vegetation, the trees, the plants, um, everything like that. So what I'm staring at right now is actually a white ash tree. And uh, it goes pretty far up there. You can see it's a pretty big tree. It's a pretty big tree. And back down here at the base of the, um, the trunk right here. One thing that's really interesting about this tree is this tree is a, is a white ash, like I said, um, planted in 1819. So that means this tree right here has been on the Mount Vernon grounds just right after the War of 1812. It was here during the Civil War, during the World War I, Spanish-American War, Vietnam War, everything. It's seen everything. And it's always interesting to think if this tree could talk, the stories you would have. Okay. One of the things I want you to notice is some architecture going on here. First off, this is called Georgian architecture. 
named after architecture under King George in England, and uh, General Washington was a big fan of this. Originally, the house was just um, a two-story section. I'm going to zoom in on that part right here. That's all it was. That was Mount Vernon. It was named Mount Vernon after Admiral Vernon, who was a uh, British admiral in, in, in the Navy. George's brother Lawrence had served underneath him in, in the war, uh, in one of the wars that they had, and uh, had a great admiration for him. And so when he came home, he renamed his house after him, Admiral Vernon, thus becoming Mount Vernon. Uh, when George took over, actually when Lawrence took over, they started expanding this house. First expansion, obviously, are the wings uh, to the left and to the right of the house. And then a third story is added along with this cupola. A lot of people think this cupola right here um, is actually for like a fire lookout or for better views. Actually had not, nothing to do with that. Um, it gets really hot here, yeah, as you've seen in, in some of my videos. And so what he would do is he would have these windows open right here and the hot air would escape out the top. It was a ventilation system. He topped it with a weather vane. And the weather vane is not there today. Uh, so it must be broken or down for construction, but it's a dove of peace. Washington first and foremost was a man of peace. He did not want uh, war. He, he fought wars because he believed they're necessary, but he did not prefer them. Now something that most guests don't um, realize about Mount Vernon is uh, basically the cupola is in the center of the house. If you look at the house, it's right in the center. And it's actually a trick that Washington used because when they built the sides, it was a little off. And so once you look here at the door, it's kind of hard to see on a video, but when you're here, you can actually see it. There's the front door. And if you look up, the cupola is a little bit to the right. I don't know if you can see that very well. So there's the door. You can actually see the window is a little off too. When you look up, the cupola is actually the center of the house, and it's a little bit to the right of that door. And uh, it was a trick, hopefully you didn't get to see that. But if you notice it, that's one of the things that absolutely amazes me when you travel to any colonial home, especially George Washington's, is the need to make your own food, to the need to grow your own food, the need to harvest your own food. 21st century Americans were so dependent upon farmers bringing our food to us that we don't even know necessarily where our food comes from. Well, they didn't have the luxury back then. And so what they needed to do is they needed to have gardens and um, you know, varying levels of gardens. The main garden obviously was the kitchen garden. This was considered the lower garden. Right here, what I'm showing to you. Sorry about that. You can see right here, the lower garden. And it really has a mix of a whole bunch of stuff, mostly herbs and um, vegetables with the Washingtons and their dinner guests ate. You're also gonna notice other types of plants. Part of this was for obviously show. Part of this was uh, to make the garden look nice. A lot of this was based on English gardens, and English gardens were very beautiful and very symmetrical. It showed the beauty of, of what uh, uh, nature can be. And, um, but another part of it was obviously insects. Um, they didn't have lots of pesticides or anything like we have today. And so what they need to do is bring other insects through other plants to then protect the vegetable crops. So let's say you're having a problem with an aphid. Uh, an aphid is a, is a little insect that will destroy lots of different types of plants. We're going to plant um, plants that will bring a ladybug, which eats aphids. And so it's called, uh, today it's called integrated pest management or IPM. Back then it was just making your garden survive. So a very interesting look. I'll just show you around at some of the stuff they would have grown and they would have eaten in English garden. Okay, so this is an example of a, a fall winter crop. This is called dinosaur kale. And it, it's called dinosaur kale because of the leaf structure. Looks like the, the side of what a dinosaur might have looked like. You can see like really uh, you know, wrinkly and tough. It's actually very good. You use it a lot in soups. Um, very, very healthy. Rich, rich in, in iron and calcium and, and vitamin C. Dino Some um, yeah. lettuce. Looks like romaine lettuce. And uh, who doesn't like lettuce? If you like lettuce, come talk to me. Love this stuff. I actually asked the workers, what do they do with all this, these vegetables? since there's not really a family to feed here anymore. And one of the benefits of working in the horticulture department here at Mount Vernon is you get to take home the stuff you grow. So they get to take this stuff home. You can also see on the sides, you have rosemary. Actually, this is lavender, excuse me. It looks like rosemary, but it's lavender. Again, a plant to bring other insects in. It's a very smart thing to do with your garden at home. Plant different types of flowers and herbs there. 
to bring those different pet crops maybe you've never seen before. This is actually going to be cauliflower. Cauliflower cabbage. It comes from the same species, looks the same. And I'm thinking actually this is going to be cabbage. And what you do is it just grows right there in the center. And you cut it out. These are very brand new plants. And they would have eaten this stuff. Okay, now this is one of Martha's favorites here, the artichoke plant. And the artichoke actually looks pretty scary, right? And what happens is it grows a flower. And if you let it continue to grow, it becomes this big, beautiful purple flower that sticks out of the center of, of the uh, artichoke plant. Well, if you pick the flower before it blooms, that's what you eat. It's the artichoke. Um, those pieces you peel off to eat um, are actually part of the flower. When you cut out the heart, in a sense, it actually has like the little like um, you know, seedy type stuff or like uh, fibers. That's actually the flower that you're cutting out. So we can actually grow wild artichokes where we live. You can also plant them. They're perennial, which means they keep coming back. So if you plant it and you harvest it, it eventually will keep coming back every single year. Um, it is not an annual. A lot of these are annuals, meaning once you, you uh, get them, they're done. You got to plant new ones like the uh, cabbage right here excuse me the cabbage right here once you get it out you got to pull it out you got to plant new ones but the artichoke was a nice plant because it comes back every single wrinkle cool. uh, how many of you like strawberries raise your hand right now now if you're home alone watching this you can still raise your hand because nobody's looking if you like strawberries this is a strawberry garden actually these are perennials again if you plant them they actually keep growing and they'll actually spread somewhat like a weed you don't want to really want to plant strawberries with anything else will just overtake it. So you want to kind of plant them in their own bed and kind of doing their thing there. And these are strawberries. And what happens is they become little white flowers, they get pollinated, and they become strawberries. And you can see there's field after field after field of them. It doesn't look like we have any right now. But these are strawberry fields that George Washington would have had. This was uh, Washington's dung repository. And dung is another word for um, feces or poop from the animals. And what would happen is they'd bring this, uh, this down here. And it was quite a bit away from the house, obviously for obvious reasons. And they would lay down the animal manure down in these big piles. And actually, they've even done that here. Um, you can't even really smell it. Um, and what happens is they would take straw, which was a carbon, and then you have the nitrogen, and then they would let it rest. They would let it uh, kind of do its thing. And what would happen is it would decompose, and it would heat up. And the reason why you want it to heat up is because it kills off all the seeds in it and like the weed seeds or anything the cow might have eaten um, or the sheep and or the chicken and so therefore you don't just start spreading things around all over your garden you let it heat up kill off the seeds in it and then the carbon and the nitrogen mixed together and actually doesn't smell that bad um, because of the carbon and nitrogen if you have the right balance it actually smells um, just fine it doesn't smell bad at all right here I can barely, barely smell it if I'm really trying. So here's where it was. Uh, this is where he would throw everything down, and then they would obviously work it into the soil. So soil. here's an heirloom sheep. Exactly how the sheep would have looked if George Washington was alive today. Uh, a little different than I'm used to seeing. You see the horns on the male hair. Hey, little guy. How are you? <laughs> Found a friend. <laughs> yeah, he did. Let me say hi back to the people in California. Yeah. I'm actually finished uh, with taping today. I'm going to go to the teacher library and I'm going to do some research. Um, I don't think that's very interesting for you to watch me read uh, or take pictures of me reading or talking with you know, different people there. So I'm not going to tape that. And then and next I'm going to be putting flags up and down and I won't be able to actually tape that. So uh, flags at Mount Vernon actually, they raise American flags at Mount Vernon and you could buy it. And uh, so they give it away to schools for free. Actually, WCI has one. Mr. Hoy has it. We have it during Civil War Day at the Union headquarters. Um, but I'm going to be doing that, and so I'm going to sign off here. Uh, it's been an awesome day, a gorgeous day here in Mount Vernon. People from all over the country. You hear every different types of accents here. Um, just talked a lot of. I just talked to somebody from Florida for a while, and just a great place for people to congregate and understand our first president. I um, just want to end, my, my daughter's doing fine. Uh, I know yesterday I, I wrote that she was sick. Um, she's a trooper, man, that girl. Even when she's sick, she does pretty well. She just kind of was mellow, and uh, she just was telling everybody around that she threw up. So <laughs> she's a pretty incredible young lady, and she's doing fine, and, and it took good care of her. So hope you guys are well back in uh, California, and um, I'll see you in three weeks. All right, take care.